Uh, I think this is an area uh, which has been close to the heart of almost everybody uh, involved in medicine and in academic medicine for a long, long time, uh, including in my generation. Uh, uh, I worked in Australia for many years running research medical schools towards the end. A lot of my time was spent uh, around this issue. Uh, and as a young neurologist, uh, just about the first international grant I got uh, was to develop neurology at the University of Indonesia. And I think most of us will have similar stories. But wow, hasn't it come on? Um, the need has always been there, uh, but it's been increasingly recognized uh, and defined uh, over the last 20 years or more uh, because of an increasingly cohesive uh, international effort uh, around global health. Uh, huge investment um, uh, moving uh, from the millennial development goals to the sustainable development goals with increasingly crisp focus, uh, an increasing international commitment to bring health uh, around the world up to the very best standards uh, is something that people have through right. Uh, a recognition of the massive complexity of that process that even with increased investment, which is still not enough, um, it requires a huge intellectual effort uh, across many, many disciplines. So we've been thinking at King's, uh, the leadership at King's and our community broadly uh, uh, for quite some time uh, about how we increasingly uh, develop cross-cutting activities, uh, bringing together great people from many disciplines around the world's most important problems. Uh, and when we look at our presence at King's and the areas in which we have expertise, uh, there's no more important area in which we feel we can make a massive contribution than this one. Uh, so our new institute uh, launched tonight uh, uh, and uh, wonderfully led by Martin Prince already, who's uh, already raised well over £20 million in competitive funding and we're just launching the institute. You know, What are you going to do next? Uh, but of course this isn't about the funding, it's about the things that are done uh, and we're bringing together um, uh, uh, great people uh, from many of our fields, uh, geography, eth ethnography, uh, politics, our global institutes, uh, across health, uh, our health partnerships, uh, King's Health Partnerships, um, uh, 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 the, the faculties on the Strand, uh, uh, the medical and health faculties uh, uh, south of the river uh, in probably the most cohesive way uh, that King's has done to date. Uh, I'm sure other examples will follow, uh, but in many ways this is the first really major cab off the rank. Uh, now, it is my special privilege to introduce uh, our main speaker, Chris Whitty, uh, you know, the few people uh, that you can genuinely say that pretty much everybody knows who they are, even if they don't know them, and Chris is definitely one of those. Uh, he's had a stellar career, a hugely impactful person. Uh, I'll just read a little. You know, he's, he was interim government chief scientific advisor uh, in 17, uh, deputy uh, government chief scientific advisor April 17, and has gone on to be the Chief Scientific Advisor for the Department of Health and Social Care, a job he's done for a couple of years. He's the Professor of Public and International Health at one of our close collaborating institutions, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, uh, and a uh, consultant physician in acute medicine and infectious disease uh, at our great partner university, uh, UCL. He was previously Chief Scientific Advisor and Director of Research and Evidence at the Department for International Development and has been a real champion uh, for global health and for the UK's effective commitment. He's an epidemiologist and physician and prior to joining DHSC, he was Chair of the Department of Health National Expert Panel on New and Emerging Infections uh, and had a role in the Advisory Committee on Dangerous Pathogens. Uh, so he's been a leader in this area himself for many, many years, uh, and it's wonderful that he's able to join us and address us uh, this evening as we launch the King's Global Health Institute. Thank you. The first thing, and I think it's worth saying, although almost everyone in this room knows this, is we've been stunningly successful, when I say we, I mean the world, in many of the major areas of health globally. Uh, this comes from a recent Lancet paper, uh, and it's really just the point I wanted to make was I wanted you to look at the bar graph at the extreme left on this graph, which is looking at child mortality in the world. 
it has dropped with extraordinary rapidity, and almost all of that drop is a combination of development, giving resources, uh, and then uh, research, which has led, been pulled through by that uh, into practice. And this uh, improvement, uh, which was recently described by the Economist correctly as the fastest improvement in child, child health ever seen anywhere, is continuing and, if anything, accelerating. So many things are going incredibly well. Alongside that, this is a well-known uh, slide uh, from Gapminder. Uh, there has, we know that there is a strong association between uh, the income of countries and mortality. We know that well. But there are two things I want to say about this slide. The first of which is the, uh, the graph actually starts uh, in the, on, the, uh, on the left as you look at it. This is life expectancy and income uh, along the bottom axis. The graph starts at 55 uh, and stops at, at 85. The first point is the majority of African countries have roughly the same mortality now that Europe had when the NHS started 70 years ago this year. And secondly, most of Asia has a better mortality rate than the UK had at the point the NHS began. And thirdly, all countries are moving right and up. So the direction of travel is we're moving increasingly into territory which essentially would have been recognisable to doctors in the NHS when the NHS began in almost every country we deal with. And that's an important point uh, in terms of what we need to do next. Now, that's not to say it's all going terrifically well. Uh, I've highlighted here some data, and the things I really would like to contrast are, firstly, in particular on the bottom, uh, the mortality rates uh, in terms of child mortality in the UK which is not absolutely the best in the world, but is in reasonably uh, good shape, uh, where we have India and Ghana, which are in roughly the same place, substantially better than they were, but substantially less good than they could be because the UK is a reasonable benchmark. But, and depressingly, if you compare, for example, Ghana with Nigeria, uh, you see two countries uh, in the same part of Africa, but Nigeria in much, better, uh, much less good shape in terms of child mortality, and this is true for many other areas. This is not because, in the case of Nigeria, the science is less good. It is because the delivery is less good, and I'll come back to that, because I think that is critical to the aims of this institute. Again, making an obvious point uh, to this audience, but the media always assume that science uh, goes uh, in a series of breakthroughs. Nothing could be further from, from the truth. The reality is that these extraordinary advances are all made up of multiple small interventions where the attributable fraction to each scientific advance is generally less than 1%. A few of them maybe make about 5%. I've given here just some of the sciences, for example, that are behind the remarkable improvement in malaria mortality that we've seen in the last 30 years. And within each of these, lots of different bits of science have happened. So science progresses by lots of small things stacking on top of one another to turn into a very big thing. You can't expect any one scientist or any one institute simply to solve a problem that, is, that in no way reflects the way it's going to go. And very much this institute fits into that pattern. Now, moving on to uh, the institute itself, let's start off by celebrating the fact that King's has a huge amount to be very proud of uh, in terms of its uh, contribution to international and global health uh, over the last decades. And I've highlighted just two of many things that Kings have done, and I've highlighted them because they were unique. Uh, one of them, uh, on the left, uh, was the extraordinary response to the Ebola outbreak, which, as I was quite involved in this in Sierra Leone, I know that a lot of the thinking, not just the delivery, but the thinking behind this, was actually devised by King's people and then operationalized by everyone else. So this was a great contribution, and in my view, without Kings being there, the Sierra Leonean uh, Ebola epidemic would have played out very differently and a lot worse. Uh, and on the right here, uh, I've shown an example of some of the work uh, in Somaliland on surgery, an area which has been until recently relatively uh, overlooked, I think, by people, forgetting that surgery and the surgical surgery widely uh, is a very major part of the uh, barrier to health care for some of the poorest. Now, 
uh, you've already heard that we have begun to move from the MDG, or we have already moved from the MDG period to the SDG period. I think most people would uh, say two things about this. The first of which is the move is a welcome one because it has picked up a large number of things which should have probably been picked up by the MDGs before. The beauty, however, of the MDGs were they were incredibly simple. We knew what we were going to do. In health, there were three main goals, and we went for them hell for leather, uh, ignoring many others, uh, and had very considerable success. The, the, the actual success we had in the areas we went for mean that the proportion of ill health in developing countries, which is from everything else, has inevitably risen very substantially. So therefore, we now have a much wider array of conditions and diseases that need to be dealt with than we did at the point the MDGs began, when, frankly, it was very heavily dominated by uh, infectious diseases uh, and maternal health, uh, and really very little else uh, tended uh, to uh, get much airtime. And I'll just give an example of one of the areas that got uh, left behind. Uh, and again, this is an area where kings have done a remarkable uh, amount of work, uh, and very impressive work uh, in general. And that is uh, that as child health has gone down, the attributable fraction of child mortality to neonatal health has steadily gone up. And the reason we will get stuck with our child health if things carry on on current trends is because neonatal health is improving at a much slower rate than all the other areas. So here is one example of the fact that because one area has got a lot better, it has thrown into stark relief the areas which have not got better. And like with uh, many of the other things that we could talk about and I'm sure we'll talk about in the panel, much of the problem is not that we do not know what to do, but that we do not know how to deliver it. So many of these children who die, die of things where, in fact, we know perfectly well from science what the solution is, but the delivery is imperfect. And that is something we need to think through uh, extremely carefully. Two final slides before I hand over to uh, the main attraction, which is actually what is the Institute going to do. Uh, first is just to take another example where King's has a very great track record, uh, but again, making an obvious point, which is let us take suicides as a proxy for mental ill health. That is a very crude proxy, but I think it will do for the purposes that I'm trying to illustrate. The first thing is people forget quite how widespread uh, mental health problems are in developing countries and how severe they are. And I had the privilege, but it was a fairly harrowing privilege, of being uh, the visiting uh, physician for the Mental Hospital of Malawi, for example. Uh, I, it was, without doubt, the most depressing bit of my medical career uh, because of the limited range of things that could be delivered. And then you compare it to where we have mental health expertise, and the mismatch is extraordinarily stark. There are many other fields you could look at, but I think mental health is one which is particularly uh, extreme. And finally, there are those issues which have not yet arrived but are going to. So this is a prevalence of raising fast, fasting blood glucose again as a proxy for diabetes that will be coming on or will come on, uh, will, has already come on. Uh, we know about, uh, for example, the fact that the Middle East and North Africa have already got to a po pro point this is a very substantial problem. But we also know that metabolically, people of African heritage are very likely to get diabetes. As we know, indeed, from our work here in the UK, in the UK our work, or the, or the whole system's work, uh, demonstrating that people of African heritage do have propensity to, to diabetes, all other things uh, compared. Uh, and therefore, we can say with some confidence that we are heading, as Africa fortunately gets wealthier, into a situation where diabetes, along with many other diseases, is going to go up and go up fast. And I could think of many other, other areas like this. With diabetes, again, the problem is not that we do not know how to manage diabetes. We do. But we do not know how to deliver the services to manage diabetes in adults, occasionally in children, in pregnant women. Uh, and as a result of that, you see people dying of diabetic complications at a very early stage. And I could repeat this again through many diseases. So I think that the emphasis of this institute, which is about looking forward to the new problems, and in particular, looking at how best to deliver care based on the really strong uh, basis that King's has already established, and including in some of the most difficult areas, is enormously welcome and will have a very substantial long-term global impact. Thank you very much. Thank you.